Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. That's it? Okay. Hi, my name's Kathy Blake. I'm going to be talking to you about uh, going beyond genes, proteins and abstracts, trying to come up with a general claim framework that would allow us to capture claims made in scientific literature. So the motivation behind my research is massive quantities of text. Uh, so in biomedicine, there's uh, 17 million entries in PubMed. They hit their 17 millionth uh, uh, early last year. Uh, but the, the key point here is that there's 12,000 new articles added to this collection every week. So if you are a scientist in medicine, that's 12,000 new articles that would potentially have something to do with, with what it is that you're working on. Uh, it's not just in, in biomedicine, in, in chemistry as well. There's 110,000 articles published in one year alone. And moreover, those articles are not all of chemistry, that's just the American Chemical Society. Uh, so there's a, a, an English society that does the same thing, and then there's a range of other journals that are not in either of those societies that have to do with chemistry. So given that there's these massive quantities of text, even if you have a well-defined information need, there's probably going to be hundreds of thousands of articles that are in some way relevant to what it is that you're looking for. So even if we get perfect precision and recall from an information retrieval perspective, your user is then stumped with hundreds of thousands of documents that they then have to do something with. Um, so for example, if you're a breast cancer researcher, there's already 150,000 uh, articles on breast cancer and there's another 5,500 published every year. More importantly, there's connections between literatures that, that are going unnoticed. So certainly, uh, even if you're only in one area of science, you can hone in and hone in and, and focus on just one small piece. And it's problematic to stay up to date even in that small area. But the more important problem here is that there may be somebody who's working on a related area in a different discipline that would feed into what you're working on. So my sort of goal here, uh, sort of from a big picture standpoint, is once you have a set of articles, how do you find patterns from within those articles um, that, that allow you to get a better picture of new findings that have been made, findings that contradict what you're working on, findings that maybe support what you're doing. Um, but this, this key emphasis here is to shift from retrieval and move more towards synthesis. So there's been a variety of techniques um, and there's a variety of ways to actually uh, make this transition. Um, the way I'm going to talk about today is trying to transform the text within the document into uh, sort of the core pieces of, of what's reported. So, for example, in entity extraction, uh, the goal is to identify um, uh, entities, people, places, organizations, if you're working in news articles. In biomedicine, uh, identifying genes and proteins, uh, diseases, treatments, chemical compounds. And there's these challenges that have been set up uh, where folks sort of get together and they compete to build a system that would uh, get, again, perfect and precision and recall for each of the entities that have been manually annotated within a collection. Um, MUC is probably the, the standard for, for news articles. And in biomedicine, there's a range of new um, uh, annotated collections that mark up where the proteins and where the genes occur. So building on uh, entities is this notion of relationships. Uh, so again, in newspapers, uh, when somebody's moved from one organization to another, in biomedicine, the key area of relationships has been between genes and proteins. So what, what kinds of genes uh, inhibit or bind to or interact with um, uh, proteins. And there's been a number of different systems, again, that, that try and replicate what has been manually annotated in a set of, uh, in, a, in a collection of text. The interesting thing about the biomedicine genre, though, is that all of these uh, approaches have been evaluated on abstracts. Uh, and so not the full text, but rather just the abstract. Um, so it's kind of interesting to, to uh, think about whether the relationships reported in an abstract 
may be in some way different uh, to those reported in the full text. The work that relates most closely to the claim framework that I'm going to share with you today is causal relationships. And so uh, most scientists uh, have been trained not to use the word causal because you may observe A and B and they're changing, but there may be a third factor C that you hadn't considered. Um, I'm going to go out there and just use the word causal because um, that's what these guys called it. Um, I, I deliberately use the word claim uh, because I, well, I wasn't that bold. <laughs> um, so in newspaper genres, um, uh, causal relationships have been proposed. And actually jumping right to the end of the slide there, uh, there's, there's in universal grammar uh, the idea that, that you could capture causality in any language. So not even restricted to uh, different genres as I'm presenting here, but, but not just even restri restricted to English. Um, uh, again, uh, a lot of the, the automated work uh, uses that as inspiration. Um, in biomedicine, uh, there's been a lot of work done on uh, identifying, identifying causal relationships and um, uh, treating relationships. Um, but I'm looking at claims. Uh, so I need to tell you <laughs> what I mean by a claim. Um, so a claim is to assert in the face of possible contradictions. What I was thinking about when coming up with this framework was mainly empirical studies where a scientist has uh, some working hypothesis, they've collected some data that may either, th either support or refute their working hypothesis, and then at the end of the paper, they're actually making some statement about um, uh, what they've found with the context of all of the materials and methods that they used in, in, in their study. Um, there has been some work done on um, annotating rhetorical structure, uh, so saying which sentence is talking about my aim, which sentence is talking about somebody else's work, which sentence is talking about my conclusions. Um, but that work would identify the sentence that I've got up there. So this study showed that tamoxifen reduces breast cancer risk. Um, but what I'm really interested in is not just saying this sentence does or doesn't report a claim, but I'm actually interested in a framework that allows me to capture what, are the, what is that actual claim. So not just that that sentence has a claim, but rather that the claim is that tamoxifen reduces breast cancer risk. So there's an agent in the sentence that's doing something um, uh, to risk. Now, how many of you knew what tamoxifen was when you walked in the door? How many of you didn't? So uh, my, my point here is that even without knowing what tamoxifen is, um, my, my claim <laughs> is that you can still identify the claim that's made in the sentence, even without uh, domain knowledge. And the whole point of this claim framework is that rather than being tailored specifically for genes and proteins, it's one layer up. So if we could identify a claim framework that allows us to capture scientific claims in general, what that would allow us to do would be to bridge between literatures, not be locked into just genes and proteins and biomedicine, but rather allow us to bridge between biomedicine and chemistry, biomedicine and, and other less related disciplines. So my goal here is to come up with this framework. Um, and I have a, a set of criteria that I want this framework to satisfy. Uh, I really want it to go beyond biomedicine. Now, the examples that I'm showing you today are all from biomedicine. The evaluation uh, uses a set of articles that was drawn from the genomics track of TREC, which is an information retrieval challenge all biomedicine, um, but the important part is that whatever the claim framework is, that there shouldn't be anything particular about that framework that makes it limited to biomedicine. So that's sort of my, my underlying goal here. My second goal is I want to capture somehow the level of confidence in a claim. Now, I'm not talking about whether I believe the claim that's made in the document. What I'm talking about is the scientists, when they stated this claim, some of their claims they're really confident about. Uh, it's directly supported by the evidence. And maybe they're making some other claims that are more speculative. Um, so maybe in the discussion section they might say, well, we saw a few uh, folks who had this side effect, but we're not sure whether that's really um, uh, going to play out everywhere. So we're, we're not as confident 
in that, in that claim. So my, my framework is, is trying to map uh, uh, terminology into uh, different levels of confidence in a claim. And again, based on what the author is saying, not what the reader is saying in terms of evaluating the quality of that claim. And the last thing that I kind of wanted to do is, given that most of the work in biomedicine has been done in abstracts, um, I was really interested in a framework that would not only take the claims from the main um, abstract, but rather, how about the claims within the body of the text? And maybe we, then we could start saying things like, well, there's more speculative claims within the body of the text than there are in the abstract. Or even we could just say how many of the claims that are in this article are actually in the abstract. My second goal here is to populate the framework automatically. And uh, although I have a system that populates the framework automatically, I'm only going to talk about the actual framework today, in part because I just in putting my slides together, <laughs> there was no way I was going to get through both sections. So I apologize if you want to hear more about the automated part. I'm happy to talk to you about that offline, but I really want to focus on the actual framework and welcome your feedback on that. Um, the, the other piece here is um, uh, the gene ontology, for example. There certainly are efforts to automatically populate the gene ontology, but even without those automated methods, that ontology is good enough that people manually annotate the gene ontology, um, uh, assign codes from the gene ontology to articles. So and frankly, even if we couldn't automate this, um, maybe having claims from an article um, uh, would be uh, uh, a service to support science, to accelerate science, um, even without the automated part. So what's in this claim framework, I hope, is your next question. Um, the, the framework is made up of, of three information facets. Um, concepts, uh, one of the concepts is usually the agent that's doing the changing. Uh, the other concept is the agent that's having that change acted on it. And I'll show you some examples of what I mean by that in just a second. It's really centered on change. I mean, there's a number of claims that are made in an article. For example, um, in the method section, a scientist might say, the, the, mouse, the, the uh, seven mice used in this experiment were killed. Now, if you were in a news article, it might be important for you to know that killed means that before they were killed, they were alive, and after they were killed, they were dead. <laughs> right? So in, in a news setting, there may be different kinds of um, uh, claims that are more important to you. But for my uh, context, what I'm interested in is claims that talk about the results of this particular study. So findings. Yes, you killed the mice after you did the study, but I would argue that that's not a claim that would be uh, of interest to a scientist who's trying to interpret uh, the claims that are made in this article. Now, there's a lot of stuff in an article that's not a claim that is important, um, particularly if you want to interpret the scope of the claim. Um, but we haven't looked at um, uh, pulling that information out yet. So the last key information facet is the basis of the claim. What are, what are you actually um, uh, making this claim on? Lastly, each of these facets can have applied to it a, a modifier, increase or decrease, maybe negation, maybe statistical significance, um, as well as directionality. Um, and this, this can apply to, to each of those. So these facets come into the framework um, in, in five different categories. And so this is where I'm trying to capture, well, how confident is the, the author in the claim that they're actually making? Um, so the first kind of category is an explicit claim. And the, the, the author has come out and said, A causes B, or A prevents B. Um, the, the facets that are required to be an, uh, an explicit claim is that you need two concepts. Uh, one concept is doing the changing. The other concept, the object, is, is the, the object that the change is taking place on. You also need some kind of nature of change. So you need, uh, you need to know, was it a causation relationship? Was it an increased relationship, a decreased relationship? So uh, the change and the change directionality might actually be the same word. And the claim basis for that is, is optional. An implicit claim uh, has, um, also has an agent and an object, 
um, but the nature of the change is, is optional. So the important thing about these claims is that we're capturing pairwise statements from within a sentence. Um, so if I tell you, I, I showed you already that tamoxifen reduces breast cancer risk. If I had also said, if, if the sentence was instead, tamoxifen and raloxifen decreases breast cancer risk, then I, I want to actually pull out two claims from that sentence. The first is tamoxifen decreases breast cancer risk. The second is raloxifen decreases breast cancer risk. So when I say explicit claim there, what I'm trying to do is actually pull out both of those claims. If there's two claims in one sentence, I want the system to grab both of them. And in fact, what I found was that in many of the sentences, there was usually more than one claim reported. Um, but the framework forces you to articulate each of those claims separately. Another aspect about this framework is that you can have a sentence that has more than one kind of claim. So you may have an explicit and an implicit claim within the same sentence. Um, so there's three other kinds of claims. Um, a correlation, uh, and in this case, we have two concepts, but the, the claim is simply that those two concepts are changing at the same rate, or um, one's increasing and one's decreasing. Um, a comparison, and then lastly, an observation. So in an observation, you get a statement, but you don't get the the actual uh, agent that made the change. All right, so, so this is very abstract. Let me throw some examples at you to kind of give you a better sense of what I mean by each of these categories. Um, so this I would consider uh, an example of an explicit claim. So this is something that the author feels pretty confident about when they wrote it in their paper. Um, in fact, I think there's, there's two claims that we could pull out of this. Um, the first is that glycine prevented WY1463 simulator production. Uh, the second is that the cell actually produces um, the WY1463 um, uh, uh, content. So if the, 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 the uh, human annotators should read that sentence and pull out both of those claims, uh, populating the agent and the change and the object in this way, Here's an example of something that I would consider an implicit claim. Um, now I kind of consider it implicit rather than explicit because it's got the word after there, which suggests to me that, that maybe there's a causal effect, but that the author wasn't confident enough to actually say um, that there's a causal relationship here. Um, so uh, I, it still may be important um, uh, in understanding what the article is about, but it's just not, the, when the author was writing it, they, they backed off from saying that there's a causal relationship here, um, but we still want to capture it. Just like the, the explicit claim, uh, we have an agent and an object. Uh, so in this case, the, the peroxone proliferators are the, 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 the object that's actually doing the change. And then um, uh, uh, the, the peroxomes are the object that's actually having the change applied to it. Um, so I'm going to go a little faster here. Um, so the, the correlations are um, simply that there's uh, two um, concepts in a sentence and that they're both changing. So in this case, um, the, the plasma and the WC count are, are correlated. Uh, a comparison, again, has two objects and the, the author is comparing these two things. Um, the interesting thing about this part of the framework is that they have to tell you on what basis are they actually making this comparison. And then lastly, observations don't tell you what actually made the change, just that a change has occurred. So my working hypothesis here is uh, that this claim framework actually captures how a scientist uh, communicates their finding. Um, and I've done some work on validating that this might be true. Um, we had uh, two studies, a pilot study, where uh, two annotators were given a draft of the claim framework, and I told them to identify every claim, every claim, even if it didn't conform to the framework, and to completely ignore the fact that this was going to be automated at some point in time. 
So the goal was to get everything and, and to verify that the framework was, was rich enough to capture what folks were saying. In the main study, um, we beefed up the number of articles. The frame claim work was locked in at that point and the process was the same where folks would go through and manually mark up um, full text documents using the claim framework. So in terms of results, um, they reviewed uh, about 5,500 articles. Um, there were uh, 1,250, sorry, 1,250 <coughs> sentences that had at least one claim. Uh, so 22% um, of sentences actually reported some kind of claim. Um, and the number of claims was about 3,000. So this kind of tells us that folks um, uh, typically report more than one claim in a sentence. Um, there were also some claims that didn't fit the claim framework. Um, prepositional phrases were, were a, a good reason why the, the framework failed. Um, so within one document, um, uh, maybe 43 claims would be made on average in this set of 29 full text documents. So if we look more closely at the, the, the distribution of the kinds of claims, we see that most of them were explicit. Now this may be that uh, for annotators, it's easier to identify explicit claims than it is to identify implicit claims. Um, but certainly the, uh, the, the evidence is from, from this study was that 77% um, of the, the total number of claims were explicit. And you can see that a much, much smaller percent were implicit. Um, you can see also um, some observations there. So uh, just under 10% were not, they were underspecified. They didn't tell you everything uh, about the claim. In terms of the number of words that were marked in each of the information facets, um, uh, actually let's look at the first column first. Um, uh, the most claims had an agent. So almost 90% of claims had an agent. Um, nearly all claims, 99% had an object. Uh, and then the change is interesting because 58% uh, 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 had a change, but um, in, in a lot of cases, the change and the change direction were actually the same word. Um, so if you take into account both the change and the change direction, uh, then you come out with about 90% uh, of claims that, that have some kind of change recognized. Um, standard way of measuring um, agreement between uh, annotators is into rate of reliability uh, and the agents and the objects had substantial agreement. The change, if you only look at the change, had moderate agreement but if you also consider the direction it was also almost perfect. I think this is probably one of the most interesting uh, findings from the study. If you look at the different sections within an article, and remember for biomedicine, the experiments to date have been on abstracts uh, and not full text for genes and proteins. Um, you'll see that if you look at the first part of this table, you'll see that of the 309 sentences that are in the abstract, 98% of them had a claim. So, I mean, you know, a third of the sentences within the abstract are claims, so it's kind of rich from that perspective. But if you consider of all of the claims reported in this article, how many of them were actually in the abstract, then you start to see that you know, there's uh, just shy of 8% of the claims that are just reported in the abstract. Um, so the sort of take home message from this one is you know, maybe we really should consider the full text um, when we're trying to interpret and, and summarize scientific literature. So we still have a long way to go. Um, uh, as I say, I'm, I'm happy to talk to you about the automated approach which populates this claim work. Um, uh, and these are, these are sort of the, the findings that, that uh, I found so far which um, were on the previous slide. Uh, so question at the beginning, we'll use the mic, so hold on for a minute. Yes, any questions? I'll, I'll start us off with one, too. Uh, obviously, very ambitious work. Thank you. Um, it, apropos of what we heard this morning, this is English. What, uh, what do you think about other languages and extensibility to other languages? So, uh, <laughs> so my student actually gave me one of the, um, uh, the Universal Grammars paper was written in some Eastern language that I never even, must confess, never even heard of before. I said, do you realize you've just given me a paper that's talking about um, you know, causal relationships in a different language. 
and, and I'm going to read it. That's the weird thing. Um, so, I mean, I think there's, there's a lot of work to do. Um, uh, the framework needs to be verified beyond biomedicine. Um, and beyond English is uh, uh, certainly a direction that I'd love to see. Um, I think I'm, I think I want to stay within science, though, for now. <laughs> the idea of a universal is is, is uh, encouraging, but um, what's the role of context in pulling out the claims? I think in the very first example, the first one you annotated, you had such and such claim in some type of cell, and I could imagine a paper which would have the same sentence not in some other sort of thing, and you could have without the context two contradictory claims, it seems. Oh, so, so negation is absolutely, so that's captured as a modifier. Um, so we definitely capture negation, which is absolutely critical. But I think there's, there's context within sort of what was the scope of your experiment. You know, if I, if I tell you that it's raining, right, well, okay, in Indianapolis it might be raining, but I'm sure it's not raining in some other place in the world. So th there's context within the scope of the experimental design, which is uh, sort of another step that I need to go down, not just getting the claims, but getting, you know, what was your actual study? What was your population? How did you treat the mice? What cell uh, uh, prerequisites did you have? That sort of thing. So essentially you'd characterise that as another, a next step in the problem space. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Kathy, I know you know a lot about chemistry and, and certainly in, in, in chemistry not all of the results are of a causal nature. There might be structural results, uh, but they're still relational. To what extent could, could you adapt this to those kinds of things? And what kinds of relations might make sense? So I think there's lots of possibilities to go sort of uh, uh, not from text. So uh, equations would be one area to move this into. Um, figures in diagrams that, that capture no, a No, I wasn't talking about n n text. I was talking about, about text, but not describing causal results, like this causes to change, but rather say spatial relationships that you extract from the text like oh you know this is bonded to this uh -huh. right could you could you use the same techniques and yes. could you adapt the framework for that so so the framework would probably capture those in implicit relationships so this you've still got two agents and objects but but it wouldn't be a direct you know this causes this um, so I, I think it would generalize to that very good well uh, a round of applause uh, Thank you so much.